I don't know if you know this or not, but Christian and Muslim missionaries arrived in Indonesia about the same time, 125 years ago. And when the Christians got to Indonesia, they did all kinds of good things. They, they built hospitals, they built schools, they built churches, but they built all of those things inside walled compounds. In contrast, the Muslims moved into the neighborhoods. And they became part of the fabric of the community. They became part of the fabric of the neighborhoods. The Christians had a compound mentality. The Muslims had a neighborhood mentality. And today, Indonesia is 86% Muslim. The idea is a neighborhood mentality matters. A neighborhood mentality matters. I believe that God has placed us in our neighborhoods for a particular purpose. I don't believe you live just where you live by fluke. I believe God's placed you there for a purpose so you can be His hands and feet of blessing to your neighbors in your neighborhoods. And and I believe that, that God wants to use you to bless others. You know, in Matthew 22, a guy came to Jesus. He said, Jesus, what's it all about? Give me the big picture of what it's all about. Give me the summary. Jesus said, here's the big deal. I'm going to boil it all down to two commands. Jesus says, here's what you got to do. you got to love God, and then you got to love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And, And here's my question. What if we took the second greatest commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves, literally? What, what if we started to love our actual neighbors in our actual neighborhoods? Um, imagine if the homes of God's people became beacons of compassion and hope in the neighborhoods. Imagine how neighborhoods in this city would be impacted. So, so here's my question tonight. It's real simple. Will you adopt your block? Will you adopt your block? We started our whole Adopt Your Block initiative two years ago. Two years ago in the spring, I did a series called Baseballs and Barbecue. Last year, I spoke on the whole idea again in spring of adopting your block. I'm doing it again this spring because this is the time of year. Finally, we have some sunshine and finally people are coming outside. And so I want to challenge you tonight to adopt your block. Adopt your block is real simple. Three easy steps. Three easy steps to adopting your block. Number one, step one, observe. Step two, connect. Step three, bless. Observe, connect, bless. Here's step one, observe. Jesus, or it says about Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 36, this. When he, that's Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Notice that Jesus saw something that is followers didn't see and that was that the people were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd the word harassed there in the greek in which the new testament was written means troubled worried confused jesus looked at the people and he saw that the people were troubled they were anxious they were confused they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd and while other people saw fishermen and and, and farmers and peasants. Jesus saw people who who had no hope, who were were troubled, who were confused, who were weary, who were full of anxiety and fear. And not much has changed. Today our city, you know this, is full of people who are troubled and confused and stressed out and tired and fearful and anxious. In fact, I'd suggest that your neighborhood is full of people who, who look good on the outside but are struggling on the inside. I have a friend in my neighborhood and we go for coffee regularly and I picked him up a couple of weeks ago and we went out for coffee and as we were driving through the neighborhood, he pointed out a couple of houses and he said, you know what's going on in that family? You know what's going on in that family? And I have no idea. I walk past these houses all the time and the houses look good, the gardens look manicured. I see the people, and and the people, they look normal and happy, but inside, they're harassed and they're helpless. 
like sheep without a shepherd. And, and so here's a question for you tonight. What would happen if you asked Jesus to open your eyes in a way that you would see people like he sees them? What would happen if, if you said, Jesus, I want to see people like you see them? Because, see, we often don't see people like Jesus sees them. I know Kenan was mentioning last week that uh, uh, Kenan and, and myself and Tom Card were down in L.A. for a conference, and, and at one point in the conference, Kenan and Tom went off on an outing with some of the people from the conference, and, and I had time just to kind of veg out, and so I walked across the street to Echo Park. Now, the Echo Park area of L.A. used to be a horrible, horrible area. But because of the influence of the local church in the area, the Echo Park area has really cleaned up quite a bit. It's a, it's a park that has a, a pond in the middle of it, and it's like a two-kilometer trail around this pond, and it's like a park. There's fields and everything, and you get a whole variety of people in this park. You get the homeless, you get the drug addicts, you get the gang members, you get the hipsters, you get the joggers, you get the dog walkers, you get everybody in this park. And so I went over there because I wanted to sit in, in the warmth because we didn't have any warmth here yet. And I sat down in the shade overlooking this little lake and this guy walks up and he's got to be late 20s. And he sits down like right next to me, within a foot of me. Like he is violating my space. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, dude, move over. It's a big park. And I turn and look at this guy and he's got all these gang tattoos everywhere. Very obvious he's in a gang. And, and I looked at him and I said, hi. And he didn't say anything. He just gave me this death stare. And I thought, this is where I meet Jesus. Right now in L.A., I'm going to die in Echo Park. And I'm just looking at this guy and I'm thinking, okay, I'm just going to keep reading my book and wait for the gunshot. And, and, and then he gets up because he sees a guy coming along who's smoking. And, and he goes down to bum a cigarette off this guy. And as he walks down, the Spirit of God said to me this. He said, Steve, I love that guy. He's created in my image. And when he came back and sat beside me, I tried to start a conversation with him. Wasn't going to happen. He finally asked me the time I told him, and he just walked away. But, but in that moment, I once again learned that how I look at people matters. I, I saw a gang guy who was going to kill me. Jesus looked down and said, I love that guy. He's made in my image. Now, he's still in a gang, and he could probably still have killed me, but my attitude changed. The way I viewed him changed. And, and we need to ask Jesus to change the way we look at people. Can I give you one way that you can change the way you look at people in your neighborhood? Do a prayer walk in your neighborhood. And you're going, what's a prayer walk? Prayer walk's real simple. You, you walk around your neighborhood, and as you walk, you pray. Now, you don't pray out loud, and you definitely don't mumble as you walk because people think you're really weird, all right? All you got to do is this. Grab your dog. Don't grab your cat because you look like an idiot walking your cat. You grab your dog, and you, and you take your dog, and you walk your dog around your neighborhood. And as you walk around the neighborhood, you just simply pray. You pray for the neighborhood. And here's what you do. As you walk around the neighborhood, you pray to see. In other words, you pray, God, open my eyes and let me really see my neighbors and let me really see the needs in my neighborhood. And then I know God's going to be faithful that as you pray to see, he's going to open your eyes. And he's going to show you the people as he sees them. He's going to show you the needs in your neighborhood. And so, first of all, you pray to see, and then you pray for what you see. So as God opens your eyes to the people in your neighborhood, and as you begin to see them as God sees them, you pray that way. As you see the needs in your neighborhood, you pray for the needs in your neighborhood. Let me, let me also encourage you that as you walk around your neighborhood, that you would pray that God would give you his heart for your neighborhood, and also that God would show you what he's up to in your neighborhood, because I guarantee you this, God is up to something in your neighborhood. You just need to ask him to show you what he's up to. So step one of adopt your block is observe. Begin to see people and their needs the way Jesus sees them. Here's step two. Step two is connect. Have you noticed that we live in a culture 
where people have become experts at disconnecting from one another. I, I mean, it's never been easier to be among people physically and yet be disconnected from them relationally, right? That's what that picture shows. I was recently at lunch with seven other people at a round table. Four of them were connected to their phone, phones more than they were connected to the people at that table. Every time their phone would make a beep, a vibrate, a gurgle, whatever, every time it would do something, they had to look. I'm talking to a person and their phone goes down, they break eye contact and they start looking down here at their phone. In other words, you're not important, but my gadget is. It's never been easier to be disconnected from people even when you're physically with them. But here's a news flash. Jesus doesn't want us to live like that. He doesn't want us to be disconnected from the people around us. Rather, he wants us to be connected to the people around us. In, in the book of John, in verse 14 of chapter 1, in the message paraphrase, it's a great, great statement. It says this, the word, that's Jesus. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We, we believe that, that God came to earth in Jesus and he moved into the neighborhood. As you read the Gospels, you see Jesus connecting with people where they were, in their villages, in the city square, in the temple, in their neighborhoods. Jesus engaged with people. He, he, he moved into their lives. He got involved in their lives. He, he went to their parties. He ate in their homes. He engaged people. He connected with them. And, and Jesus wants us to follow his example. As the Father sent the Son, so the Son sends us. And Jesus wants you to go hang out with the people who don't know him. He wants you to go hang out with people. Jesus wants you to invite people that don't go to church into your homes. He wants you to go to their parties. He wants you to eat in their homes. That's what Adopt Your Block is all about. It's about connecting with people in our neighborhoods. Let me ask you, how well do you connect with the people in your neighborhood? Do you know your neighbor's names? When, when was the last time you had a beyond high conversation with your neighbor? When was the last time you had some neighbors over for dinner? Let, let me give you a few practical ways you can connect with your neighbors. One of the best ways to get to connect with anyone is to know their name, right? It really helps if you know someone's name if you want to connect with them. So in your bulletin on the sermon page is this little diagram that we gave out two years ago when we did baseball and barbecues. And here's the big idea of this diagram. That center, that center spot there, the house, is your home, your apartment, your condo, your tent, your, your trailer, wherever you live. That's you right there. And, and, and what the eight spots are, are your eight closest neighbors. So the eight houses closest to you. The eight condos on your condo floor. The eight townhouses in your complex. Whatever. It represents the eight closest neighborhood units next to you. Now here's a question. Can you fill out the names of the people that live in those eight homes? If you can't, here's your challenge this summer. This summer, as people start to get outside, find out the names of your neighbors, your eight closest neighbors. That will go a long way to connecting with people is getting to know their names. Secondly, and I said this two years ago, I said it last spring, I'm going to say it again, throw a party. People love parties. If you want to bless your neighborhood, throw a party. I think Christ followers should throw some of the best parties around. A party, think of all the benefits to a party. A party gives you the opportunity to get to know people and for them to get to know you and get to know each other. A party gives you an opportunity to increase the sense of community in your neighborhood. A party gives you the opportunity to hear about the needs of people. I'm always amazed in our neighborhood that when we get together, I hear about needs in my neighbor's lives I never knew existed. Getting people together and talking brings out needs. Sometimes you can meet those needs. Sometimes you can pray about those needs. A party gives you an opportunity to have fun. And looking at some of your faces, some of you need a little fun in your life, all right? 
A party creates an environment where relationships can develop. And a party gets people speaking differently about Jesus and his church. If you're a churchgoer and your neighbors know you're a churchgoer, they might not know what to do with you. Right? They might think you're a little weird because you go to church, and some of you are. But anyway, um, <laughs> here's the deal, though. When you have a party and you get your neighbors to come over and they get to meet you, they get to find out you're not so weird. And then they go away and they think, hey, that person is different than I thought. Maybe their Jesus is different than I thought. And, and, and here's the thing. Jesus calls us to be salt and light. And one of the things salt does is it adds zest. It adds flavor. So how about we add some flavor to our neighborhoods by throwing some great parties? Every, every Canada Day, Sylvia, my wife, and myself, and our neighbors, Phil and Kathy, the four of us put on a neighborhood barbecue for our neighborhood. And we supply the meat, and other people bring stuff, and everybody gets together. We close down our cul-de-sac, and we have an amazing party. And it, it all starts around 2 to 3, and I think we'll be done at 7. Last year, I think we closed it out at 1 a.m. in the morning. Thought, we should really go inside. Um, but it's such a great time. We had like 50 people drop by last year. And it's a great way to get your, to know your neighbors and for them to get to know each other. In fact, in your neighborhood, there's probably new people that have moved in. They'd love an opportunity to get to know the other neighbors in the areas. So this summer, throw a neighborhood barbecue. Throw a neighborhood party. Have fun. Get to know your neighbors. It's a great way to connect with them. Now, here's something I've noticed about regular church growers. Often, Christ followers have a tendency to not go to parties of people that don't go to church because they feel like they're going to be a fish out of water. And, and, and I talk to, to people that come to this church and they go, I was invited, but I didn't go because, you know, I didn't know what it was going to be about. I didn't know anybody. None of them go to church and, and I just wouldn't feel right. Can, can, I, can I say this to you tonight? Listen, if your neighbor invites you to a party, chances are they like you. <laughs> so go to the party and have fun. Okay, can, oh, always remember this. Jesus, the guy we follow, was accused of being, and this is a quote from Scripture, a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And we should be accused of the same thing. Now hold on just before you get excited. Yeah, everybody, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, the whole lot about the glutton and drunkard part. Let me just clarify. All right. People said to Jesus, you're a glutton, you're a drunkard, and you hang around with tax collectors who weren't nice people back then and sinners. And the reason Jesus was called a glutton is because the people he hung around with were gluttons. He wasn't a glutton, but the people he hung around with were gluttons, so people that criticized him assumed that he was into that too. Jesus wasn't a drunkard. There's no question that Jesus drank wine. None at all if you read the Gospels. But Jesus wasn't a drunkard. But the people around him got drunk. And Jesus hung around with people that the religious people didn't think other religious people should be hanging around with. Tax collectors and sinners. The lowlifes of society. And yet Jesus says that's exactly where I want my followers. I want them hanging out with people who are far from me. I want them hanging out with the people who struggle. I want them hanging out with the gluttons and the drunkards. I want them to be a light in those situations. So I'm encouraging you, go to those parties. And if the religious people come along and say, what were you doing at that party? You look them straight in the eye and say, I'm being Jesus. You should too. Right? So... Remember that. Go to their parties. Here, let me give you a few other ways that you can connect with people real quick. Invite some neighbors over for dinner. People love food. People love to eat. They love to socialize. That's why Jesus ate at so many dinners. They're a great way to socialize with people. I heard a great term this week, scruffy hospitality. And the, the idea is your house doesn't have to look perfect and your yard doesn't have to look perfect to have people over. You know, the people you invite over, their house is a mess too. It only looks nice because they're afraid when you go over to their house, they have to make it look nice. 
So if they come into your house and it's a mess, then they'll invite you over to their house because they'll feel comfortable for you to come into their mess or to see their weeds in their backyard. Weeds of the proper kind. By the way, just stressing that. <laughs> Here's a few other things. Host a neighborhood garage sale. Play road hockey in your, in your, on your road or some other sport with the kids in the neighborhood. Set up a lemonade stand if you've got young kids. Great family activity, great way to connect with your neighbors. If you have a need, ask your neighbor to help you with that need. My neighbors know, do not let Steve use power tools. Bad idea is not going to have a happy ending. So they help me out, and I'm thankful for that. Walk your dog around the neighborhood, and as you walk your dog around the neighborhood, again, don't do the cat, no one will ever talk to you, but walk your dog around the neighborhood and say hi. As you say hi to your neighbors, you're engaging them. You know, there are tons of ways that we can connect with the neighbors in our neighborhood, and I encourage you to, to sit down with your roommate or your spouse or your family and say, how this summer can we connect with the neighbors in our neighborhood? Now, I really want to say this. This is really important. It is really important. As you connect with your neighbors, please, please remember, Christ followers, please remember our neighbors are not religious targets or projects, right? Really important to remember, we love people not to make them Christ followers. We love people because we are Christ followers. You see, we love people because Jesus called us to love people whether they ever follow him or not. So step two is connect. Here's step three, bless. Observe Connect and then bless. Jesus came to earth to bless and to serve others. Mark 10.45 says this. Even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Like Jesus, we need to serve others because we are blessed to be a blessing. Right, one of you got it right. I got to preach on it more. We are blessed to be a blessing. And one of the primary places we should be a blessing is in our neighborhood. So how can you serve and bless those in your neighborhood? Let me give you a few questions to get you thinking of creative ways that you can bless and serve your neighbors. The gospel means good news. So here's the first question. How can your life be good news to your neighbors? How can your life be good news to your neighbors? I believe, as I said earlier, God has put you in your neighborhood for a reason. So how can you use your gifts, your abilities, and your talents to bless those in your neighborhood? How can you use your unique gifts, talents, and abilities to bless those in your neighborhood? Here's not a question, but a statement. Beware of the nudges of God's Holy Spirit. Sometimes you'll be walking around your neighborhood, and the Spirit will nudge you to talk to someone. Or the Spirit will nudge you with a need that He wants you to meet. Be obedient, and as you're obedient to that, you'll see God work in some amazing ways in your neighborhood. Now, how many people here are introverted? I just realized I was getting the introverts to put up their hands, right? <laughs> I should have said the ex. How many people are extroverted? Me! Introverts are like, yes, I am, right? But if you're an introvert and all this talk of connecting and, and serving and blessing your neighbors is freaking you out right now. You're like, that is so out of my comfort zone. But can I remind you of something Mother Teresa said? She said this, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. And so what small things can you do that would bless someone in your neighborhood? There's a story about a mustard seed in the Bible. And, and, and it only takes a small expression of love, of grace, of blessing for God's kingdom to begin to break through into your neighborhood. I want you to think about your neighborhood for a minute. If I was to ask you, why do you live in your neighborhood? Most people would say this. I live in my neighborhood because it's a nice place for me and my family to live. You notice the focus there? I live in my neighborhood because it's a nice place for me and my family to live. The focus is on me and my. Can I suggest a change of focus? What if we as Christ followers shifted our thinking and to say, Jesus has placed me in my neighborhood for the sake of others. Jesus has placed me in my neighborhood for the sake of others. 
How would that change the way you lived in your neighborhood? I don't know if you fly much. I fly enough. Uh, not as much as some in the room, that's for sure. But I, I fly. I do fly occasionally. And I have... I'm a very antisocial person on a plane, all right? Like, I don't want to talk to anyone on a plane. I just don't. Don't judge me now. That's the way I am. It's my place to just get into a little bubble. And I have this routine. I get on the plane. I get to my eyes, aisle seat. I sit down, unzip my backpack. I take out my headphones, put them on my head, plug my headphones into my iPhone, turn on my jazz music, get my Kindle, and start reading. In other words, no, I don't want to talk to you, right? That's the way I'm on a plane, and I will just sit there and read book after book. So, I'm flying from Winnipeg, after seeing my son in February, to Victoria. And I get to the seat, and I sit down in my aisle seat, and before I can open my backpack, this young lady is sitting right next to me. She was in her late 20s, nicely dressed. She says, hi. I said, hi. And I'm thinking, okay, we've said hi, now get your headphones out. And, and she goes... How are you doing? I'm like, no, she wants to talk. <laughs> so we start talking, and we talked for two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. I'm like, we just started talking. And now, because of what I do, I have a great conversation stopper, right? Because as you start to talk to people, one of the questions people say to you is, what do you do for a living? And I always say, I'm a pastor. That's it, baby. They're pulling out the airline magazine. They had it with me. So we get up in the air, and we're talking, and she says, and what do you do for a living? I think, oh, this is the moment. I said, I'm a pastor. She looked at me and said, I've been wanting to talk to a pastor. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, really? But at that moment, I realized this was like something I'd call a divine appointment. Like God put her next to me because he wanted me to talk to her. And, and we talked for the whole flight and she started telling me about how her marriage was breaking up and we had this amazing conversation for two and a half hours and it, it was great uh, to be able to connect with her like that. But I tell you all that to tell you this. We were talking and I started telling her why I was in Winnipeg because my son was going to the University of Winnipeg and she said to me, where does your son live? And I said, Furby Street. She went Furby Street, and her eyes got as big as saucers because Furby Street is the worst street in Winnipeg. It is the most crime-ridden street in the most crime-ridden area of Winnipeg. In fact, the first night I was staying at my son's place, five doors down, someone got shot on the street. Last summer, someone got stabbed on his doorstep. This Apartment block is just down the road from where he lives. It's one of the worst drug houses in Winnipeg. And you're going, why does your son live there? You know why? Because him and some other Christ followers decided they were going to move into that area of Winnipeg and adopt that area of Winnipeg and allow God to use them to make a difference in that area of Winnipeg. And so my son is intentionally living on Furby Street to be used by Jesus to bless the people that live in that area. And there's some others that are doing the same thing in surrounding streets, and they have a little house church, and they get together on Sunday, and they celebrate what God is doing, and then they go out into the streets Monday to Saturday, and they live for Jesus in a very crime-ridden area. And I thought, if my son can do that on Furby Street, I can do that in my cul-de-sac out in Colwood. And you can do it in your street. And so my question as I close out tonight is, will you adopt your block? Will you say, yes, I'm going to adopt my block. I'm going to observe. I'm going to connect. I'm going to bless. Whether it's a townhouse complex, an apartment, a condo, a farm, a cul-de-sac, whatever it is, will you adopt your block? And I know what some of you are saying. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You have no idea how busy I am. You're asking me to do one more thing. I know how Busy people can be. We, as you know, we've been short-staffed at the church, and, and I almost feel guilty. I haven't been able to spend enough time in my neighborhood because I really enjoy being in my neighborhood. But let me say this. I'm not calling you to another program. The last thing we need is another program. I'm calling you to a lifestyle, a lifestyle, where you go live 6-8, meaning you go walk humbly, 
love mercy, and act justly in your neighborhood. That's a lifestyle. And, and if we have to pull back on some programs here at the church to free you up so you have more time to go adopt your block, I'm good with that. Because I think one of the primary places God wants to use us is in our neighborhoods. So I want to encourage you to adopt your block. You know, over the last two years, over 100 families in this church have adopted their blocks. And I want you tonight to join with us. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to do a couple of things. And the seat in front of you is an adopt the block card where you can sign up. And I want to encourage you to take that card, fill it out, and then leave it at the connecting desk, that little... um, desk under the TV in the foyer, just leave it there and we're going to sign you up. And the reason we want you to sign up is for uh, a reason of resourcing you. We want to send you a monthly newsletter that will tell you stories about how people are adopting you, their blocks, give you ideas so you can use some ideas creatively to adopt your block because every block's different. So we want to we want to resource you. We're also going to start a, on our SBC website. Uh, we're going to be putting up a, a members only adopt your block page again, where we can share resources and stories. And so we want you to sign up so we can resource you to adopt your block. A couple other things in your bulletins: a card that says "Adopt Your Block." On the back, there's a statement and a question for each of the three things: observing, connecting, and blessing. Finally, I want to encourage you to go to the back of the auditorium by the map there and pick up as many of Dolph the Block stickers as you want. And I want you to encourage you to put this. The great places to put this is on the inside of your front door so every time you leave your door, you see Adopt Your Block. The other place is like on the mirror so when you're getting yourself beautiful in the morning, you're reminded that you need to adopt your block. So will you do it? Will you join us? Will you adopt your block? And together, let's see what God is going to do.